The time is now 6 p.m. Our regular City Council meeting for June 28, 2022 is now in session. First on the agenda is Council Member Davis will lead us with the opening prayer and the pledges of allegiance to the flags of the United States and the state of Texas. Please rise. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this meeting. We pray for the many people working daily to support this community. We ask that you extend your loving hand to protect our city employees in every department as they dedicate themselves to serving our residents. Thank you for your loving influence in our lives, the blessing you have placed on the community, and for those who support these efforts. Give us wisdom as we walk the path you've laid before us and allow us to continue to work together to fill your purpose for each of us. In your name we pray, amen. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, Council Member Davis. All right, we have a few presentations. Uh, we're going to uh, do the first presentation is going to be on uh, neighborhood services. Ms. Vera? All right, good evening, Mayor, Council. I'm Rebecca Vera, and I'm the Neighborhood Services Manager here in the City of Shirts. So I just wanna talk a little bit about the services that we're offering since we're a newly formed department. Um, just a reminder that we are comprised of two divisions, which is the Code Enforcement Team and the Environmental Health, which is filled by the Sanitarian. Our mission is to protect and promote the health and safety and keep Shirts a beautiful place to live. Neighborhood Services has developed a new logo, which is at the bottom of each slide, <clears throat> excuse me, and a proactive approach to engage neighborhoods to reinvigorate the sense of community. Our goals are to protect the community from environmental and health hazards, to promote the quality, education, and enforcement of city codes and ordinances so that Shirts is a great and livable community, to work hand in hand with community stakeholders to increase and maintain a high quality of life provide interdepartmental assistance and direction when enforcing city regulation. By taking a proactive approach and seeking out the potential to engage with residents, this will change how residents see code enforcement as more of a service to the citizens of Shirts. We have been able to connect residents with existing resources such as Meals on Wheels, the Texas Ramp Project, and utility assistance. Um, we've also educated residents on city standards, and this is where we've kind of faced some challenges. When we've begun addressing distressed properties, um, such as those that have parking uh, issues, those are both found in commercial and residential uh, situations, and we've actually started reaching out to property owners on those particular properties and even issuing civil citations, taking those property owners to court. So I'd like to talk a little bit about some of the properties that we've seen here. So on the left is the before picture. Um, the violations are numerous, and this is in the middle of a neighborhood. This is actually affecting the neighbors around it. So before on the left, after. We did end up issuing six citations to the property owner, and we were able to get that property abated. On the left is a before picture. This case was actually a year long, um, started in the middle of COVID, kind of took a back seat for a little bit, but we did end up getting the property cleaned up and we were able to successfully remove all those inoperable vehicles. The benefits to having a strong, consistent code compliance are endless. We maintain the property values 
create a sense of community, foster resident pride in their neighborhood, and improve property maintenance. Building on the attitude of neighbors helping neighbors encourages interaction with each other, builds pride and safety, and it serves everyone when we're protecting and preserving housing. Our programs in the works are HOA engagement. We're actively seeking invitations to HOA meetings so we can attend and hear the residents firsthand. So we're not always at the end of a complaint, but rather being in front of it and being proactive. We do support the Love Where You Live outreach program, so that is a biannual event. We are hoping to kind of branch off uh, and host many events in between the larger events. Um, resource outreach. We've actually submitted grant applications and to see if we can start getting some extra funds to fund our programs to all basically community outreach. So coming soon, this one's really exciting, talking about our Shirts Community Tool Shed. This tool shed will offer the use of lawn care equipment for any Shirts resident at no cost. This program is going to be held in collaboration with Parks and Recs. We'll be able to utilize their system so you can go online and reserve whatever equipment we have available, from lawnmowers to hoes to shovels, hopefully a wheelbarrow, maybe a pressure washer, whatever tools we can reuse from other programs like Parks and Recs, and whatever tools that we can find through grant funds. All right, we do have a new email address. That is going to be at mytownatshirts.com. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Vera. You know, um, before I open it up to council, just the name, the change of the name has a proactive approach to it from code enforcement to neighborhood services. Thank you so much for, for doing that. Council, uh, questions? Council Member Brown. Number one, I want to thank you for reaching out to the HOAs. I know you've already been to ours and uh, well received, so thank you on that. On the uh, uh, tool shed, uh, it, you know, just, just knowing how people are, uh, about how much equipment do you think you're going to be able to uh, acquire? Well, I have a wish list out there, so I'm going to ask for the moon. So hopefully, I have about 20 different items on that list. Um, ranging from lawn mowers to edgers, weed eaters, the more common things. Sometimes access to lawn equipment is what holds up compliance. So hopefully by offering this for free, um, we'll be able to resolve a lot of those issues. Okay, so yeah. to answer your question, I think it's a great ho idea. hopefully uh, 20 reservations pieces. Reservations about getting things back in working order and a lot of other communities around us have existing tool sheds. San Antonio and Austin, they've had great success, um, and they haven't had a really big problem with losing pieces of equipment. You like the logo? Love it. Now, on the, uh, the tool shed, uh, sometimes um, can they uh, donate some of those lawnmowers? Uh, Absolutely. I'll take the truck and go pick it up. Boy, you're more than welcome to donate any piece of equipment. That's great to hear. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, Council Member Hayward. I just have a question. Um, when you, when on a lawnmower, will mm -hmm. they be responsible for putting the gas in it or will the city be providing that? So when they check it out, it'll be a full tank. Any additional gas, they'll have to follow the manufacturer's guidelines. Depending on the piece of equipment, can be regular fuel, can be the 50 to 1, depending on the piece of equipment. Okay. So yes, we'll, we'll issue it full, and then they have to fill it if they need additional. Okay, so they won't have to bring it back full. That's correct. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Our next presentation is uh, concerning uh, City View. Ms. Delgado. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Um, so unfortunately, I am having some technical difficulties. This computer is not connected to our city network, so I'm not actually able to log into the back office workspace side. So rather than giving you half of the presentation tonight and then having to come back maybe at the next meeting, I'd rather, um, if it's acceptable with um, the council, to postpone the City View presentation until the next meeting. That way we can get all that worked out and I can give that full presentation. Is there a motion to postpone? Absolutely. Okay, and second by Council Member Scagliola. All those in favor? 
It's postponed, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that was easy, that was quick. All right, we'll go on with city events and announcements. Announcements of upcoming events, uh, Mr. Kelm. Good evening, Mayor. On Monday, July 4th, city offices will be closed. However, we will be celebrating the 4th of July with the Jubilees. And so we will begin at 9.15 with the Let Freedom Run 5K, where we will don our best patriotic gear and try to outrun the mayor on the parade route. The parade begins at 9.30 a.m. In a time-honored tradition, individuals and nonprofit groups are welcome to join the City of Shirts for a patriotic parade through downtown Shirts. The float and fireworks that starts from 6 and goes till 10 is sold out, so if you're too late to get your tickets tonight. We have live music beginning at 6 p.m. Groove Night. We'll be providing live mu music at the Pickerel Park. We have a kids' carnival going on beginning at 11 a.m., and that will be at Thulemeyer Park. And then the fireworks show, the hit of the day, begins at approximately 9.15 p.m. So bring your blankets and lawn chairs to Pickerel Park for a spectacular finale to Jubilee. And we say thanks to HEB for sponsoring that. On Tuesday, July 5th, we'll have a swearing-in ceremony for our new fire chief, Greg Rogers, at 5.30 here in the council chambers. And then our next regularly scheduled council meeting is at 6 p.m. in the council chambers. That is it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kelm. Announcements and recognitions by our city manager, Dr. Brown. Yes, Mayor, thanks. Uh, tonight I'd like to uh, recognize our Public Works Department. Uh, they've just been hard at it for several weeks now with the, all the hot weather fixing um, water main breaks. And they seem to be springing up all over the city um, at unpredictable times and places. So I just want to thank them for all the great work that they're doing on that, keeping our water system going in the face of this extreme heat. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the Parks Department for all the great work they've done to prepare for the 4th of July, thank them in advance. Uh, their team's been really working hard, and I certainly do appreciate all that they've done. And also from the Parks Department, uh, Pickerel Park actually went down for maintenance on Saturday night. There was a, a pump that failed. Uh, we didn't know how long it was going to take to to repair that pump, but Jared Montney um, swung into action and he was able to get it repaired so that it was able to reopen on Sunday at, at, at the normal time. So thanks to Jared, thanks to Lauren. Um, they, they just do a great job um, keeping our parks going. And that's all for tonight, Mayor. Thank you. I'd like to echo some of those things. Our Parks and Recreation, thank you so much for putting that uh, Great Northern Trail uh, ribbon cutting and definitely our Parks and Recreation team. Uh, this is the, the biggest event that uh, our city will be hosting the 4th of July Jubilee. Thank you all for your hard work. Public works, yes, uh, a lot of water issues have surfaced uh, based on this dry weather that we're having and, and they were very quick to respond to several situations. Thank you, uh, thank the public works for us. Also, uh, Chief Long, uh, his retirement ceremony was uh, last week, and I just want to say uh, thank you for your outstanding service, Chief, uh, to our community, and uh, enjoy your retirement, sir. And I also want to uh, just say that we welcome our new police chief today, uh, and welcome to our city, uh, Chief Lowry. All right, we'll move on to the hearing of residents. Uh, this time I set aside for any person who wishes to address the city council. Each person is limited to three minutes and we ask before addressing the council, for the record, please state your name and address. We have no one that signed up, so we'll move on to consent agenda items. Consent agenda items are self-explanatory and information packets are provided to council and available for public viewing. These items require no separate discussion unless requested by council. Item number one, the approval of the minutes of our regular meeting on June 14th, 2022. Item number two, resolution number 22R61. A resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, accepting the semi-annual reports with respect to the capital improvement plans and other matters in connection therewith. Item number three, the appointment of Mr. Bradford Pitting Pittinger to the Tax Reinvestment Zone Number 2 Board, replacing the vacancy of Chris Price and the reappointment of Clark McChesney, Jr. Item number four, appointments, reappointments to various boards, commissions, and committees. The Building and Standards Commission, the appointment of Alex Wentis as a regular member, and appoint Stephen Ikes 
as an alternative, alternative member, alternate member. The Historical Preservation Committee, the appointment of Robert Durham, Sue Bolsonac as regular members. The Planning and Zoning Commission, the appointment of John Carbon as an alternate member. The Traffic Safety Advisory Commission, the appointment of Andre, Andres Dominguez, Paul Wiley, and Stephen Ikes as regular members in the appointment of Allison Freeman as an alternative member. Item number five, resolution number 22R62, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing an amendment to the resolution of number 21R112 for the purchase of a brush truck for $170,000 to Siddons Martin Emergency Group for fiscal year 2021 and 2022. Mayor Pro Temp, continue reading the rest of the consent items. At item number six, resolution number 22R64, a resolution by the City Council of the City Shirts, Texas, appointing members to the Alamo Area Council of Governments Regional Emergency Pre Pre Preparedness advisory committee and other matters in connection therewith. Item number seven, resolution number 22R66, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, authorizing EMS debt revenue adjustments, utility billing, billing debt revenue adjustments, and Shirts Magazine debt revenue adjustments for certain inactive outstanding receivables and other matters in connection therewith. Item number eight, resolution number 22R65, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, approving the Shirts Seguin Local Government Corporation fiscal year 2022-23 water rates and other matters in connection therewith. Item number nine, resolution number 22R67, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, approving a budget amendment to the Shirts Seguin Local Government Corporation fiscal year 2021-2022 annual budget and other matters in connection therewith. <clears throat> and finally, item number 10, resolution number 22R68, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, approving the Shirts Again Local Government Corporation fiscal year 2022-2023 annual budget and other matters in connection therewith. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Council, do any of these uh, need to be removed for separate action? Is there a motion to approve? Consent? So moved. Second. We have a motion by uh, Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, second by Council Member Hayward. Council, any other comments? Let's go ahead and call for the vote. Aye. 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 We have four ayes, no objection, motion passes. All right, we'll move on to item number 11. This is a public hearing. Item number 11 is ordinance number 22S25. An ordinance by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, amending the comprehensive land use plan by changing approximately 22 acres of, of the future land use map from the agriculture conservation land use designation to multifamily residential land use designation located approximately 1,100 feet west of the intersection of FM 482 and Herbertus Road, also known as Comel County Property Identification Numbers 401-272, 401-273, 401-274, 401-275, Seven five two three seven seven five two four six. City of Shirts, Comal County, Texas. Our first reading. All right, Ms. Harrison, floor is yours. Good evening, Council Mayor Dr. Brown. This is for Ordinance Twenty Two S Twenty Five FM Forty Two Comprehensive Land Use Plan Amendment. Megan Harrison, Planner. So here is the property outlined in green. It's approximately twenty-two acres of land. This is FM Forty-Two. Hubertus Road, Danville Middle School. So we sent out on May 13th, uh, 13 public hearing notices, and we also published in the San Antonio Express on June 8th. At the time of the staff report, we did receive one opposed and two in favor of the comp plan amendment. So here is the current comprehensive land use plan. Uh, currently the property is designated as agricultural conservation, so what that means is, is it primarily mainly large lot uh, residential and then as well as 70% um, open space and then the agricultural businesses landscaping which is limited to the agricultural conservation district. 
So the applicant is requesting that the comp plan be amended to the multifamily residential uh, land use designation. This would allow the applicant um, to develop the property as uh, an apartment multifamily. So again, this is for approximately 22 acres of land, which was those five acres, or five parcels, excuse me, that comprise to be the 22 acres of land, which is going through the comp plan amendment. So here's the aerial exhibit. Again, the property is outlined in green. So currently the land uses that are around this property um, are primarily the large acre residential, so essentially to the um, west and then to the north. There is also some light industrial and commercial uses, so such as Casa Verde Farms, Intercoastal Contractors, the uh, Plumbing Company, uh, Texas Cutting Core. So there are some several industrial businesses in this area. Also, as you probably noticed, there is the Danville Middle School that is also uh, in this area across from this property. And there is also a planned elementary school along Hubertus Road. So this area, as you can see, is, is growing in the sense of commercial businesses, industrial businesses. So with this area coming from FM42 all the way to Schwab, so kind of in between, we've seen that growth happen. And so with that, we see that there is some need for some housing in the area. So the applicant has requested to amend the comp plan, and then the next thing we'll do tonight is also the rezoning. So the Planning and Zoning Commission conducted a public hearing on May 25th, 2022, where they made a recommendation of approval to the City Council with a vote of four to one. Staff is in support of the Planning and Zoning Commission and recommends approval of the Comprehensive Land Use Plan to amend from agricultural conservation to multifamily residential land use designation for the approximately 22 acres of land. And the applicant is here um, in case there are any questions. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Um, does the applicant want to make a statement? One moment, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, Chris Bancroft with uh, Texas Multifamily Capital, 1111 West 6th Street in Austin, Texas. We are a central Texas-based company focused on multifamily development. Um, as stated, we're requesting an amendment to the 2002 Comprehensive Land Use Plan, amended in 2013 for the five contiguous parcels, uh, approximately 22 acres at the corner of FM 482 and Hubertus Road. Um, our goal is to develop a high quality attainable garden style apartment product in order to provide rental housing for the local church workforce and families of the adjacent Danville Middle School and the brand new elementary school that is being built as we speak. Central Texas is uh, growing faster than any of us ever expected and church is in a um, direct beneficiary of that growth uh, with some of the largest companies in the U.S. adding new facilities right here in town. Um, the city has experienced 40 percent population growth since 2010 which is the equivalent of adding 15,000 residents every uh, 10 years. Population growth and economic growth can bring great things to a city, but um, also presents challenges. And one of those is the uh, rising cost of home ownership that um, we're all subject to right now. Um, those rising costs create a lack of affordable and flexible housing options for the local workforce. Attainable rental uh, housing helps provide a flexible solution to that. Uh, as Ms. Harrison stated, the Planning Commission reviewed our application to amend the Comprehensive Land Use Plan and made a recommendation to approve the amendment. Uh, the comp uh, plan indicates agricultural conservation for effectively all of the area along FM 42, including these properties. And while the current zoning for the exact same land along FM 42 is uh, almost entirely M1 manufacturing light, that, that creates a contradiction since the M1 zoning takes precedent. In other words, the um, current and future landowners can choose to build light industrial in spite of what the existing comp plan indicates. As noted, the uh, extremely important factor, uh, at least in our uh, rezoning effort, is the presence of Danville Middle School that enrolls roughly 1,000 children uh, located right across the street. And that school was completed in 2018, well after the uh, 2013 comp plan amendment. It's also a brand new elementary school that I mentioned um, just south of the uh, subject site. Um, in our opinion, industrial development is not really a compatible land use next to a large school. The, the zoning tends, that zoning tends to push people away while, while schools uh, tend to draw people in and residents in. 
Um, there really are virtually no schools in Central Texas, with a few exceptions, where you find light industrial next to um, schools. Um, our understanding is the city is undergoing a revision to the 2013 comp plan. Today in 2022, we're in a very different situation than we were in 2013. Since then, the I-35 corridor has exploded with growth. Shirts has succeeded in, manuf um, in attracting major employers like Amazon, Cisco, Caterpillar. Um, and along with those companies come their employees who, of course, need housing. Um, at the same time, we're experiencing skyrocketing cost of homeownership right now in Texas. Um, along with that, rising interest rates and rising inflation. Not everyone can or necessarily wants to own a single family home. Uh, there's only 1,700 apartment rental units in the city of Shirts with 45,000 people. Um, in markets lacking rental housing, employees will, that need affordable housing and flexible housing options will tend to look elsewhere if they can't find it locally. And that uh, presents a risk for the local businesses if their employees can't find a place to live. Uh, as I noted, rising gas prices and inflation only make that situation worse by um, eliminating the uh, incentive to commute. So at the current pace of population growth, we're going to add another 15 to 20,000 people here in the next 10 to 15 years. Um, that rental housing is already in high demand, and it's only going to grow uh, based on the, the current statistics. As noted, if nothing changes with the comp plan, light industrial uh, manufacturing facilities can and will be built around the middle school and the elementary school. That's going to create its own problems that, in our opinion, could be prevented today by approving a comp plan amendment to allow for a complementary land use next to these schools. That would provide an important buffer to any future industrial development in the area, um, help relieve pressure to the local single-family housing market. Uh, it will provide support for the retail and commercial corridor that exists along I-35, just to the south, and provide even more reasons for the local workforce to live inside the city of Shirts. I hope that City Council will look to the Planning Commission's positive recommendation, along with my comments, and formally approve our request for an amendment this evening. Thank you for uh, your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, sir. All right. This item is on the agenda as an open public hearing. Is there anyone in attendance who would like to address the City Council in reference to this subject? And for the record, please state your name and address. <laughs> Dana Eldridge, 2628 Gallon Fox Drive, Shirts, Texas. I'm glad to see we've got some more apartments coming in or some more multi-housing uh, with the Shirts Housing Authority. You know, we might wind up even trying to get some of those in there. You never know. Um, my concern with this is I, I live out close to that intersection of 35 and Hubertus Road, 1103. You've got the new school down there. You've got another school getting ready to be built. On the other end, you've got all of the large trucks hauling concrete, gravel, debris that runs right up to the intersection of where our fire department is going over 2252, that area. Um, it's just, with that school, it was amazing how much traffic suddenly showed up at that corner there at the Valero, the Randolph Brooks, that whole area. Now they got a second school. Parents are picking their kids up and delivering them rather than letting them take a bus or, and here they can't walk. And then you still have all the extra construction going on I'm just a little concerned about the traffic and the number of cars and what it's going to add to that area. Um, not against getting extra housing. Don't misunderstand that at all. I'm just concerned. Right now, half of the, the road, half of Hubertus Road is closed off. They're, fix, they're evidently making it a little wider, making it a little better for the turn-ins to the schools. Um, you don't have a full stoplight. You've got a flashing light down at the, the corner down there. Uh, and then coming the other way, it's strictly a stop sign going to the construction or going on up towards 35 and where you got our, our fire department at. So just a little concern about the traffic. That's all. Is there anyone else like to address the council? 
Going once, going twice. Public hearing is closed. Okay, council, floor is open for discussion. Council Member Brown. Thanks, I'll start. Uh, the, the need for affordable work, workforce housing is, uh, I don't think there's any argument with that whatsoever. We need a lot of it. Uh, I certainly don't wanna see uh, residential neighborhoods on that side of uh, 35, but uh, a uh, development like this I think is, is key. You know, as everybody's talking, you got the two schools there, you got Amazon, you got Cisco, you got our fire department right down the road. Uh, the, the area is growing naturally and I think we need to have some uh, uh, housing options for our people. And again, apartments are a great way to start. Uh, you may want to ask, uh, you know, how close they are to, you know, food and things like that. Well, it's right across the street is Evo, right across the street is the other uh, city's entertainment district as well. But uh, so it, it's not like they're out in the middle of nowhere. And these aren't people that are gonna be walking, they're going to be driving. Uh, and as the city grows, we're not gonna stop traffic. You know, it, it, it's a matter of handling it. Where is it gonna go? Uh, but we're not gonna, we're not gonna stop the growth of traffic in, in cars on the road. Um, so I, I, I just think it's a, a, a natural element of growth and I think it's gonna be a positive aspect out there uh, without being uh, industrial or anything along that line. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, comments? Yeah, I, I, I wasn't going to say a whole lot, but uh, the, I, I can see a need for um, uh, housing. They, you know, they say if you build it, they will come. Uh, it seems like we reversed things a little bit. We built the schools, and now we're going to build the uh, communities around the schools instead of the other way around. I don't have a problem with that. I really don't. Uh, if, if these are, are going to serve as really true affordable housing uh, uh, or, or workforce housing, um, I am all for that, I really am. Um, but I don't like the idea of a bait and switch either, where you try to pass it off as affordable housing and then it turns out not to be so. So I haven't seen any plans uh, or, or any, any discussion on that. But as far as um, uh, putting the apartments in this general location, I drive down that road uh, uh, quite often and I, and I, I see the, uh, the M1 uh, being developed around there. Uh, I don't have a problem with uh, this not being combat compatible with uh, that, that part of the part of the city. So, looks good to me. That's all I have, sir. Okay. Council, any other comments? Is there a motion to approve ordinance number 22 S25? So, second. Moved. And I heard a second, did that come from, okay, motion was made by Council Member Hayward, second by Council Member Brown. Any other comments? Let's go ahead and call for the vote. Aye. 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 We have four ayes, no objection, motion passes. All right, we'll move on to item number 12. This is also a public hearing, ordinance number 22S26. An ordinance by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, amending the official zoning map by rezoning approximately 22 acres of land to apartment multifamily residential district R4, located 1,100 feet west of the intersection of FM 482 and Herbertus Road also known as Comel property identification numbers 401-272-401-273-75375-75237-75246, City Assurance, Comel County, Texas, first reading. Ms. Harrison, you have the floor. Good evening, Council Mayor. Dr. Brown, this is for Ordinance 22S26, FM42, Rezoning, Megan Harrison, Planner. So as we just saw, the five properties here outlined in green, again, FM 42, Hubertus Road, Danville Middle School. We sent out uh, 13 public hearing notices on May 13th, 2022, where we also published into the San Antonio Express on June 8th. At the time of the staff report, we did receive uh, two responses in favor of the proposed rezoning. 
Here is the zoning exhibit um, before you that shows the five parcels that make up approximately 22 acres of land. Currently, the two properties um, to the west, these two here are zoned agricultural district, and then the small one here, and then the two larger ones, uh, so the three total, are currently manufacturing light in one district. The applicant is requesting to, turn, to rezone the, uh, these five parcels to apartment multifamily residential district. So here is the current zoning map just illustrating uh, the agricultural district and then the manufacturing light. So again, as we kind of spoke on the comprehensive land use plan, given the current land uses surrounding this area, and then now with the approved comprehensive land use plan amendment that uh, council just approved, uh, it is in conformance with the comp plan uh, for the apartment multifamily residential district. So the Planning and Zoning Commission conducted a public hearing on May 25th, 2022, where they made a recommendation to the City Council with a, a vote of five to zero. Staff supports the recommendation of the Commission and recommends approval of the rezoning from Agricultural District and Manufacturing Light to Apartment Multifamily Residential District. Again, the applicant is here. Um, you'd like to give a presentation? And he is going to give a presentation as well. All right, thank you. Um, those two exhibits right there. Go between. Oh, just the top. Okay. Thank you again, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Again, my name is Chris Bancroft, Texas Multifamily Capital, 1111 West 6th Street, Austin, Texas. We are requesting a zone change for these parcels to an R4 apartment multifamily zoning. As I mentioned earlier, our goal is to develop uh, high quality garden style apartments at attainable rents to serve the housing needs of the city of Schertz. Um, to clarify a comment or question earlier, we're not proposing subsidized housing or tax credit housing, um, rather conventional multifamily at, um, at Schertz market rates. I'd like to address four important issues regarding our proposed development in this zoning. Those include infrastructure, aesthetics, traffic and affordability. As far as infrastructure, specifically I'm referring to drainage, wastewater, and water service. And I believe the slide here that you're looking at uh, shows our proposed, I can't see this. Uh, is there a way to blow it up? Thank you. Proposed wastewater lines and the paths we'd have to, to take, but um, we're aware that we'd be obligated to extend wastewater service to the area and I factor that into our analysis per this exhibit. Um, we are also aware that water service is currently with Green Valley Special Utility District. We've already engaged them uh, for a feasibility study and are working to understand our options there. We heard flooding and drainage concerns from neighbors during our planning commission meeting. And our understanding at this point is that those issues and their resolution along FM42 are solely in the hands of TxDOT and therefore outside of our purview. However, um, and with that said, we are willing to do whatever we can to ensure that we are part of a solution and not part of a problem. Um, I'd like to note that our civil engineers have a legal duty to ensure no adverse impact to any neighbor adjacent upstream or downstream with their and our work. So our plans would only improve drainage and wastewater issues in the area. As indicated on in our site plan, which I had um, shown earlier, put that here, on the northeast corner, we have factored in an oversized detention pond to capture excess runoff and stormwaters to protect those downstream of us. We are willing to fund all the necessary infrastructure improvements, cost participate with the city where necessary and appropriate, uh, not only for our project, but for our neighbors and all the future growth in the area. Number two, aesthetics. It has to look great. The site has high visibility from the road, and we want this to be a project that, um, something that we're proud of and that the city and the community are proud of. We're proposing garden style apartments uh, that are three story buildings with a relatively low density footprint, roughly 20 to 30 units per building with ample green space, uh, plenty of trees, family oriented amenities and thoughtful architecture to uh, complement the area. Traffic, we heard comments about traffic earlier this evening. Um, we are aware of the traffic concerns along FM 482, um, specifically the truck traffic. We can't ignore it, um, we, we're aware of it. Uh, we are proactively working with TxDOT and our civil engineers to ensure that this future development has all the uh, appropriate traffic controls in place with safety and mobility as the primary goals. And those could, th uh, could include things like center turn lanes, deceleration lanes, traffic lights, crosswalks, improved signage and lighting, and any other necessary road work required. 
We're also taking into consideration the traffic and safety needs of the adjacent schools and are again willing to fund these roadway improvements. And then number four, affordability. Um, Schertz has a rapidly growing workforce that needs rental housing as discussed. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, not everyone can or necessarily wants to buy a single family home. Um, I've mentioned the word attainable a few times tonight, and uh, just to clarify what I mean by that, we are targeting apartment rents averaging roughly $1,500 a month, depending on the unit size. So that could range from $1,000 to $1,500 a month. Uh, those are typically 12-month leases. And you can uh, compare that to a $350,000 single-family home, which would require a minimum $40,000 to $50,000 down payment, and a mortgage payment over $2,000 a month on a 30-year mortgage, probably higher today with the way interest rates are going. It's a big difference. Um, the one thing we can't do is any of the things that I just mentioned without proper zoning, and that is first and foremost why I'm here tonight. If City Council does approve our zoning this evening, the fact remains that we still need to build the appropriate infrastructure before we can start on a project. The bottom line is we need the zoning in place to secure financing for all the infrastructure and the project itself. With the zoning in place, we can move forward on this project with, with confidence. We would partner with the City of Shirts, our neighbors, uh, to make sure this ends up being a success for the entire community. Zoning is merely the first step in that process. The zoning change should be based on market demand and compatibility of land uses, and we strongly feel that the current situation warrants that change. With all that said, I, res uh, I respectfully ask that City Council approve our request for rezoning. Thank you to City Council, Mr. Mayor, for your time this evening. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for the information. All right. This item is on the agenda as an open public hearing. Is there anyone in attendance who would like to address the City Council in reference to this subject? Going once, going twice. Public hearing is closed. Council, floor is open for discussion. No discussion? I just have a, I just have a couple of questions. Um, well, with clarification, there is a big difference between market rate and workforce apartments. So I just want to make that clear. Market rate is what the market demands the price. Uh, the, my other question is uh, how many units? Uh, any idea how many units? Be approximately 300 to 350 units, sir. 350? Okay. Thank you. All right, council, comments? Is there a motion to approve ordinance number 22S26? So moved. Second. We have a motion made by Council Member Hayward, second by Council Member Brown. Any other comments? Let's go ahead and call for the vote. Aye. 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 We have four ayes, no objection. Motion passes. Thank you, sir. All right, we have item number 13. This is also a public hearing. Resolution number 22R58, a resolution by the City Council of the City of Shirts, Texas, accepting a petition for voluntary annexation within the extraterritorial jurisdiction of the City of Shirts. Ms. Harrison, you have the floor. Good evening, Council Mayor Dr. Brown. This is for resolution number 22R58, Oakmont Place Petition for Voluntary Annexation, Megan Harrison Planner. So here is the property outlined in green. This is Schaefer Road, FM 1518 to the uh, west. This is Ray Corbett, and then this is the uh, Corbett Elevated uh, storage tank as well right here. So the exhibit before you is the annexation exhibit showing approximately 45 acres of land that are currently under delayed annexation agreements uh, with the City of Schertz. The property owners have submitted a petition for voluntary annexation to be within the City of Schertz city limits. This is just the first step in the annexation process. Um, so this is not to approve the annexation, this is just for the applicant to proceed forward with with the annexation process overall. So there will be an ordinance for the annexation as well as a zoning that will come before council at a later date in order to approve the annexation and to approve the zone change uh, for this property. So staff is recommending approval of resolution 22R58, accepting a petition for voluntary annexation. Thank you, Ms. Harrison. Again, this uh, item is on the agenda as an open public hearing. Is there anyone in attendance who would like to uh, to, excuse me, <laughs> who would like to address the council in reference to this subject? Going once, going twice, public hearing is closed. Okay, council floor is open for discussion. There appears to be no discussion, all right, which is a good thing. 
All right. Uh, is there a motion to approve resolution number 22R58? So moved. Second. We have a motion made by Council Member Davis, second by Council Member Hayward. Any other comments? Let's go ahead and call for the vote. Aye. 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 We have four ayes, no objection. Motion passes. Okay, we'll move on to a roll call confirmation. Our city secretary, Brenda Dennis, will provide the roll call confirmation for agenda items one through 13. Ms. Dennis? Yes, I w yes Mayor, the, there was a motion to postpone the uh, presentation of City View made by Councilmember Hager and seconded by Councilmember Scagliola. The vote was unanimous. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, Council Members Davis, Hayward, Brown voted yes, no one voted no. Consent agenda items one through 10, motion was made by Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, seconded by Council Member Hayward. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, Council Members Davis, Hayward, and Brown voted yes, no one voted no, motion passed 4 0. Ordinance number 22S25, motion was made by Council Member Hayward, seconded by Council Member Brown. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, Council Members Davis, Hayward, Brown voted yes, no one voted no, motion passed 4 0. Ordinance number 22S26 on first reading, the motion was made by Council Member Hayward, seconded by Council Member Brown. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, Council Members Davis, Hayward, Brown voted yes, no one voted no, motion passed 4 0. Item number 13, resolution 22R58, a motion was made by Council Member Davis, seconded by Council Member Hayward. Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola, Council Members Davis, Hayward, Brown voted yes, no one voted no, motion passed 4 0. Thank you, Ms. Dennis. At this time, we don't have a quorum, so we're going to hold off on the workshop till we have the. Uh, we'll take a five-minute recess till we have a quorum back here. Five minutes. In five minutes. Okay. Yes. I'll be back in five minutes.
our quorum has been re-established, uh, so we'll continue with our workshop. All right, we have a workshop discussion regarding uh, the well be the the fees being waived and charged for the Main Street area. Mr. Thank James. You. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so uh, we were asked a few weeks ago for our presentation on the fee waivers for Main Street. Um, as most of you recall, starting about 2015 or 2016, uh, we began waiving fees on the Main Street area. And generally, those are kind of building permit fees. So the planning submittal fees, the building permit fees that folks pay, those were waived. And again, that started, I think, was first adopted in our fee schedule with 2016, but I think we actually started it back in, in 2015. And we are waiving it for our Main Street incentive area. So this is the map of the area where the grants apply. It's where the fee waiver applies as well. So as you can see, it runs from Aviation Boulevard down to Schertz Parkway on both sides of Main Street. It doesn't cover all of the lots, the ones that don't front Main Street, the, the ones that, that front exchange, uh, but not Main, aren't covered in it. Um, and so that's what we've been doing. Uh, but then as we've had new development and, and more development on Main Street, uh, it's kind of come up that we didn't waive every single fee or thing like that associated with it. So anyways, uh, a business that wants to sell alcohol, for example, still has to go through the city secretary's office. They still pay that license uh, fee that goes along with it. Uh, they still pay for their water bills. They still pay for a meter when they get the meter for the city. Uh, but there are a few things that popped up that they do pay that with some of the development out, some of those can be substantial. So tree mitigation fees, street cut and tap fees, and then impact fees, roadway, water, and sewer, both city and SSLGC and CCMA. And I'll talk about those in a minute. So I think we've only had one property that's had to pay tree mitigation fees to, to date, I think. Um, you know, council a few weeks ago or a few months ago amended the UDC that stipulated that capped the tree mitigation fee at 10,000 per acre or proportionate amount thereof. So I think the fee charge for the one property property that's come in, fairly substantial new development, $7,600. But that stuff does add up with all of the associated fees. We also have the street cut and tap fees. Uh, I think the street cut fee is $50. The tap cut fees are $25 each. So if you're tapping water and sewer, it's $50 there. Plus with the street cut fee, it's $100. So again, not a huge amount, but but then the flip side of that is it's not a huge amount, but you're still charging folks for it and they have all these other costs. And then the other are the, the impact fees, um, roadway, water, and sewer. And those are a bit different, I'll say. So a little bit of background on how we charge those because it's a little bit of a different process with it. So for roadway impact fees, we talk about it that generally you kind of pay once. So if we have a project that comes in on a green field piece of land and they come in and say, I want to put in a 5,000 square foot building, we'll assess roadway impact fees with that. But unless they expand the square footage of, of the area, we generally don't reassess roadway impact fees. The way our ordinance on roadway impact fees works is you take that 5,000 square foot building it may come in as an office building, operate for an office building for five years, the tenant moves out, somebody moves in that says we're gonna do a big mailboxes, et cetera, or something like that. We don't reassess them roadway impact fees. You charge the initial. The only time we would reassess is if they come back in a couple of years later and say, hey, we wanna add on another thousand feet, square feet, we'll then just charge them roadway based on that new thousand square feet. So it's, it's generally a one-time fee that you pay. We don't do that with water and sewer though. What we do is each time somebody comes in for most kinds of permits, they will reevaluate that water or sewer to see if they believe that that'll generate additional demand on water and sewer. And so again, that same example where it's an office building, tenant moves out, somebody new comes in, they would retake a look at it. Now that doesn't mean they would actually charge another round of water and sewer impact fees, but it might. They'll reassess, so with that permit, they fill out an impact fee, uh, water and sewer impact fee sheet, 
that goes over to Public Works. Public Works does the assessment and makes that determination. So we've had another, a number of folks on Main Street who've uh, taken that house, they want to convert it to a business, and they've been reassessed that fee, or it's converted to one business or another, and it can add up. Um, and again, it's that sort of difference between what they were and what they're, they're going to. But then additionally, similar to roadway impact fees, if they add a meter or they upsize the meter, similar to roadway, we'd reassess it and do it that way as well. So as I said, roadway, water, or sewer are a little bit different, so let me talk about the first two generally. So one of the things that, that you know, we didn't do back when, but we probably should do now um, if we if we move forward with this is staff would suggest that we come in <clears throat> um, and create um, a neighborhood empowerment zone and the neighborhood empowerment zone is set up by um, the state of Texas um, and it's really the purpose of that is to allow communities to say hey we have a special area unique circumstances unique things um, and we want to bring about reinvestment redevelopment things like that it sort of forms the basis and so our suggestion was if, if council's direction is yeah let's look at those tree mitigation fees tap and, and cut fees, what we'll probably do is run that in conjunction with the creation of an empowerment zone. Uh, so we kind of have that all fully covered and, and probably should have done that anyways. Um, and that'll sort of form the basis. Again, their criteria to be met. It, some, of the, some of the criteria is similar to when you would create a TERS, but it kind of becomes this basis and we would have a plan and things like that. So not hard to do. Staff can pull that together fairly quickly. We can model it after uh, some of the uh, empowerment zone kind of programs they have in other communities really kind of cut and paste, um, you know, pick and choose for, for those. Um, City of Fort Worth, by way of example, um, has a has a pretty good empowerment zone. They do some other things as well that we probably don't, but we'd probably cut and paste that and could be back with council in, in a few weeks with it. Um, as we get toward the, the budget cycle, what we probably do is prior to the budget, typically end of July, August, uh, we do the fee schedule again and we would just kind of tack it on there. So we can have that to you in fairly short order if that's the direction. Now I will say that you can make that area, you have to meet the criteria, but there has been talk of do we want to look at going beyond the Main Street area in the future. We could certainly create that, empower, that neighborhood empowerment zone more broadly. We could start with just the program and that becomes the document that I show with Fort Worth to focus on Main Street, but we've got it in place to, to jump over 78, for example, if we wanted to to go a, a bit further with it. Um, so again, if council's generally inclined, hey, we've done these fee waivers, here are a couple that we didn't hit, um, then certainly what we could do is, is if the direction is for staff to do that, we could do that. Um, the impact fees are, are a bit different because of the way we establish them. As you know, we do a study with that. The study we designate a, a service area for impact fees for water, for sewer, for roadway. Um, and, and the study assumed when we did that, here are the areas that we're gonna charge and it all sort of works together and built together. And, and so that's a little bit more complicated. If the direction is to work on that, we probably need to spend some time with the city attorney uh, and see how we might be able to do something like that, what issues it would create. But again, other places I've, I've looked at where they've not wanted to include an area, they have essentially updated their study to sort of exclude a particular area from the impact fee assessment. So we'd have to look at how we do that. Um, but I think the logic of that might be with this redevelopment we're having, are we really needing to expand our infrastructure system because of this redevelopment and the nominal increases in water and sewer demand and traffic? Or is the, the infrastructure system for roads, water, sewer that really serve that already in place. It's been in place for years since it's been there. And yeah, occasionally you have properties kind of move up and add more traffic or use a little more water. But on the flip side, you have some come in and that generate less traffic, use less water, things like that going forward. But again, I want to be clear, that would only apply to the city of shirts fees. We don't control the CCMA and the SSLGC fees. So uh, again, the, the couple of fees I mentioned, pretty easy to do. We can kind of uh, have that done in a matter of a few weeks, typically with the fee schedule and the empowerment zone creation. We'll need to work on the impact fee a little more if you want to do that 
um, you know, to, to make sure we understand some of the constraints and issues. But that's essentially my, my presentation and be happy to answer uh, any questions. Thank you, Mr. James. All right, uh, Council Member Davis, uh, this was placed on the agenda per your request. Uh, privilege is yours to ask the first questions. Thank you. Um, I think this is a, a worthy topic to pursue. Um, Council's had several discussions over the past weeks, months, uh, and we've put a significant amount of effort into that Main Street redevelopment project. Uh, and from my perspective, a lot of these fees that, we, that Mr. James just talked about, the tree mitigation fee, um, the sewer tap fees or the road, road cuts and stuff like that, as well as the roadway impact fees, uh, I think they're all <coughs> great options or great things to have when we're talking about new development, but this is not really new developments, it's redevelopment. And when you look at Main Street, the other challenges that folks have down there, um, if our goal is to make Main Street a walkable community, a community gathering place, and encourage new businesses to come down there, uh, I think it's, it's kind of difficult with the challenges we have down there with the floodplain <coughs> and everything else because just, just the requirements due to the floodplain and stuff add extra design cost yeah. to those wishing to participate in this activity. Uh, it adds construction costs. Uh, so to me, it's, it's another tool that we have that would potentially help encourage somebody to come down there and put in the things that we're looking for. Um, again, as, as Mr. James said, it's not a lot of money, but you know, nowadays with interest rates and, and everything else going on there, uh, it's, it's, I think it's something that's a viable option for us to explore. I agree, it's, I, it shouldn't apply to any of the operational permits right. that somebody needs. If, if they need a license to operate a particular kind of business, that's, that's an operational thing that a business would need after the fact. But uh, as far as getting them in and up and running, I, I think it's not a bad idea to look at, at waiving those fees that we can waive initially and then re-looking at uh, the impact fees to, to see if we can eliminate the city portion in this particular district. Thank you. Council Member Brown. Quick question on, uh, uh, on the fees, you know, having to, to abide by the state uh, uh, codes and whatnot. Is there a way to, instead of waiving the fees, reassess them differently within that uh, Main Street zoning? So if you mean reassess them, we could certainly, for the Main Street area with an empowerment zone on these fees, we could reduce the fees or adjust the, the fees, the tree permit fee, for example, we could, instead of doing away with it, we could say it's half of what it would be in a different area. If, is, is that what you're asking? Well, yeah, that, that way we don't have to worry about going all the way to a full waiver. Uh, you know, it, yeah, we, we certainly could. I think staff would probably say it's just as easy to just do away with them entirely. Like I said, I can only think of one project that's had tree mitigation fees. It's new development, so it, it's not like it's a big problem on Main right. Street. They tend to keep it. Um, you know, we probably don't collect more than $300 a year, if that even, in TAP. Um, and street cut fees for the Main Street area annually. So I think staff would say it's, it's frankly just easier to build in the system. Hey, w w we waive them entirely. Sure. Uh, you know, I, again, going back to the roadway and, oh. and the water fees, you know, if they can be assessed <clears throat> differently without having to, to go through that process of waiving them. We can certainly look at that. I mean, I, I yeah, let us go look at it. It's a Small little bit trickier. For the most part. So we can go back and, and kind of look at it. Like I said, I think we've only had two properties be assessed roadway impact fees. And again, one was fairly small, it was a fairly little expansion, then one was a demo and a new construction. Um, it, it tends, I don't think we have a whole lot that get assessed the additional water impact fee. It tends to be more the sewer Im, impact fee on it as well. And so um, let us talk to the city attorney and maybe explore some of the options, maybe look at the data more carefully so we kind of understand some of the implications. Right. So we can come back with options. I could just interject briefly. One of the ways that, one of the things that you can often do in an empowerment zone, 
is you enter into an agreement somewhat like an EDC would where you can reimburse the property owner from the sales tax they generate on their property. So if, if we didn't want to <coughs> waive some of these, like the impact fees or whatever, we could certainly enter into an agreement where they get that money back through a rebate of sales tax they generate on their site. I mean, you, you could be fairly creative. Yeah, so we'll go look at what some other folks do and come back with a few options. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Council, any other comments? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Scagliola. Yeah, I kind of like the idea of uh, waiving the fees as a way to incentivize the uh, development on Main Street. Uh, targeted targeted development uh, along the in, entire street. Um, I'd like to talk to you more about the empowerment zones, but I, I, I think we can do that offline. Okay. I understand what a TERS is, uh, empowerment zones. I kind of like the idea. I'd like to explore just a little bit further. You know, I, I complain about Main Street a little bit. You know, I, I, I know we have a need for uh, to fix the sewers. Okay, three point something million dollars just for for the sewers alone. Okay, I'm 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 good with that. It's something that needs to be done. But I'm not I'm not real real uh, enthused about throwing money at a at a at, at at a project, hoping that maybe something will stick. You know, uh, you, you can do that with enough money. You can make something work, but is it sustainable? That's that's a big problem I have. Uh, I I would rather turn the development of Main Street over to the small business owners or, or business owners in general. Let them decide their their own destiny. Um, I think that's the best way to uh, stimulate the uh, the Main Street. Uh, is it a viable uh, option for the city to pursue? Uh, maybe not. Maybe not for the city to be funding it, but to encourage the small businesses that are in the area to do the development on their own with us as a partner. If I may, Councilman, and again, sometimes I get pretty good at reading. Um, I'm making a statement, and sometimes, I, you know, it's a question, and, and so I, I think that's a that's a valid point. I think. One of the things we've talked to a lot about over the past, and this one certainly has taken a long time, but I think, yeah, one of the concerns that staff had is this, build it and they will come, and that often doesn't work. And, and I think, so if you look at some positives of the grant program, some of the incentives, the rezoning program we've, we've done, it was really to, to, to start getting that redevelopment to happen. And, and, and so you're right, what we don't wanna do is, go build this stuff, spend a bunch of money on it, and it's literally the same exact businesses, same exact Main Street that we just spent a bunch of money on it. And so I think what, what we would say is that you've seen that redevelopment starting, you've seen that investment coming, um, and that really part of what this is, is it's about what does the private sector need to do? What do the small business owners need to do? You know, we've talked about city maybe buying properties. We've not done that. Private property owners are buying up those properties and you, you see values going up. I stood out today to deal with one, you know, because it's in the floodplain and we have those issues. Last year the property was valued uh, with the structure at $88,000. This year it's over $150,000, so it's almost doubled. So, so we've seen that happen. And so really, particularly with the Main Street Committee, we've talked about a lot of what is our role, what can we do? Well, as Councilman Davis said, because of some of the issues on Main Street, older structures that we want to keep, and, and if you've lived in an older house, you know how expensive that can kind of be. Um, the floodplain issues that increase cost. And so the idea was, let's try to bring down those upfront costs to get people to buy in. Small business owners with limited funds, that's the role. The other role is, let's look at where we can step in for parking. We've had some issues there. And again, with the nature of development, people can't, you know, it's, it's not like the apartment complex that was here that can buy 22 acres put in all the parking they need. You've got a building, a front yard, a tiny backyard. There's not a way to do that. So the city stepped in. And then just like we do everywhere else, with Tri-County Parkway or Live Oak or things like that, we step in and we deal with the infrastructure. So philosophically, I think, I agree with you entirely that the private sector has to step up and do their role and, and has to make that investment. They have to take those risks. They have to do that. And, and the city, let's stay in our lane, let's do the things that we can do pretty well, and let's not get so far out. That doesn't mean we don't want to be progressive because a lot of cities do a lot of things, but I think our focus is let's stick on these core services that people expect. So police protection, fire protection, fix their streets, make sure the faucet turns on, make sure that the sewer drains, and, and let's do those kind of things 
going forward. And, and it really has to be a partnership. So again, we, we've talked about city role with events. But what I tell you, I've tried to avoid is the city's not going to get in there and manage and create a property owners association. Those folks need to get in and create their own property owners association. Happy to have a staff person come and sit back in the corner, but not our deal to, to manage and, and do, and they need to start self-policing that. So philosophically, I think, agree. We may disagree exactly where that balance is found. But yeah, this is about queuing up for the private sector to do it just like we talk about with some of the other things where we make investments in infrastructure, um, you know, to help those things happen. Cibolo Valley Drive and the city putting in our portion of money on that, for example, uh, similar kind of thing. So. Okay. I have one question for you. Um, you know, the fee waiver has, um, has certainly attracted redevelopment. At what point, in your opinion, do we stop and focus on another portion of our city? Um, 10 years, 20 years, any idea? It's when we hire somebody else to help, to help focus on that. I mean, here, here's what I'll say, Mayor, and, and I, I guess I took your question to mean, to me, it, we're not ready to stop Main Street. We, right, we, no, we're not. We need not. to get it going. But there are certainly older areas of the city that need work. 78, for example. So again, part of what staff's looking for is, if we create this empowerment zone, do you want to look at us just hitting 78 as well? But the other thing I'll remind you is the presentation that Neighborhood Services gave tonight. And, and, and that, what one of the big philosophical shifts that they've had is they've started focusing on the older part of town where we've got folks, and it's really about partnership. And so it's not just about the city going out and issuing the violation. It's about the city working with love where you live. You know, Mark, Mark was out there last time they did that. Council uh, Whitaker was out there. Some of you have been out there doing it, helping to clean up. It's about the neighborhood tool shed. If your mower's broken and you can't get it clean, I've got a mower you can borrow and get it mowed at safe staff time. So it's about working hand in hand with folks. And, and again, I would say this, you know, we, we talked a long time about the older residential areas, the need to start getting in there and doing infrastructure. We've got the water line project going in, but we've heard from a lot of folks you're just patching, you're not doing the whole street over arrow. So yeah, I think, I think from a staff perspective, it really is about starting in the older parts of town and improving the quality of life. And having worked in San Antonio, I'll tell you this, our goal of this is not to jack up home values and price people out. It's so that the folks who've lived there for years and who are gonna live there for years have a better place to live and enjoy it more because the neighbor's backyard isn't full of junk and doesn't have rats and stuff running out of it. It's that we're investing in our infrastructure in the older parts of community. And it's not just over here, it's up in Northcliffe and things like that. So yeah, I mean, I think at some point we need to start looking at where's next and, and how we grow this mm -hmm. for our community. I, I think that's certainly the case. We are a city of almost 45,000 people. The age we are, we start dealing with these issues that we need to focus on, which is new for us. We haven't had to as much before because we just haven't hit that point, but we're getting to be like those cities. So yeah, I think, this is one that we need to hear from you. Hey, have you looked at this area? What could we go in and do and, and make it better and improve on? Thank you. Council, any other comments? Thank you, Mr. James. There's no action taken, no roll call confirmation required. So, uh, we'll so just to be clear, the yes. assumption staff has is that you want us to come back with the empowerment zone and chat with Councilman Scaliel offline probably have staff look at a couple options of what we think the area should be, the policy, and again, with the fee waiver, and then we'll work with city attorney, come back with options on both of those going forward. Okay. All right, request and announcements. Any uh, further announcements from our city manager, Dr. Brown? Nothing further, Mayor. Okay. Council, any possible updates or information requested from staff? Council, any possible items you'd like to place on the future agenda? All right, we'll go on, proceed with the announcements by council members. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Scaviola? Nothing tonight, sir. Council Member Davis? Uh, nothing other than attended uh, Chief Long's uh, retirement. The city did a great job sending them off, uh, and I appreciate their, their efforts and 
in uh, acknowledging his service to the city. Council Member Hayward. Uh, yes, attended Chief Long's uh, retirement. It was a, a great re um, retirement ceremony. Did appreciate it. And I attended the TML Board of Directors um, conference in Houston this past week, so I was there Thursday and Friday. That's all. Okay. Council Member Brown. Once again, thanks to the city for uh, taking care of Chief Long's retirement. Well done. And uh, look forward to the 4th of July. All right. The time is now 716. We stand adjourned.